very pretty. <laughs> Please don't. I love you. Hey, what's going on? You're now tuned in to the PVD Horror Podcast. I'm Brandon, and on today's episode, we have Daniel Richardson. He's the development producer of the new upcoming documentary, Terabytes, The Evolution of Horror Gaming, from the creators of the critically acclaimed In Search of Darkness trilogy, first-person shooter. It's time for a whole new world of horror. Daniel, thanks for coming on the show, man. If you like all things horror and want to get the best horror news, interviews, and reviews... Like, subscribe, and ring that bell to follow us and satisfy all your horror Thanks needs. Thanks for having me. Really glad to be here. I appreciate it. So um, we have worked with Creator VC on helping promote the In Search of Darkness projects. Um, you guys do a great job. We had Tori on the show a few months ago talking about the new 90s doc that's coming out soon. Uh, when I heard you guys were creating uh, terabytes, I was really excited. The campaign has officially launched. Um, can you tell the listeners about this project and how they can pre-order and become backers? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So uh, if you don't know about us, as uh, Brandon's already said, we've done documentaries before. We were probably most known for our In Search of Darkness franchise, which was a trilogy of films, soon to be a quadrilogy as we enter the 90s period, looking at 80s horror films. And what we did throughout that uh, documentary series was we produced 15 hours, because these these docs are like five hour long mega docs. We produced 15 hours of content where we looked at all of the films throughout the decade, and we took on interviews with talent who worked on those films, be them the directors, the performers, the makeup artists, and just had them tell the stories of how those films came, came together and paint an overall narrative of the whole evolution of the genre through that period. And so after that, we did our first-person shooter documentary, which was a similar thing, but looking at the 50-year history of uh, first-person shooters with people in it like Warren Spector, who made System Shock, John Romero and John Carmack, you know, the guys behind Doom, and just kind of did a similar thing where we looked at the whole evolution of that genre. So with Terabytes, what we're doing with this one is we're kind of merging those two worlds. So we've got what we're feet finded firmly in, in the horror genre, and we're big lovers of horror. And uh, personally, I'm a big fan of horror gaming. And obviously, we've just sort of branched into gaming documentaries. So we're taking both of those kind of concepts and smashing them together. And we're producing this do mega documentary series, um, five, full ep five long episodes, um, an hour long each for a total of five hours, um, which will look at the evolution of uh, horror gaming. And that is available on pre-sales now if you want to help us fund the film, which uh, fund the series, sorry. And that can be got on terabytesdoc.com. Um, I'm sure there'll be links in descriptions or whatever. But basically, uh, if you go on there, you'll see all of the cast. You'll see our well, fantastic new trailer. Um, we've got some really, really insanely good names in there, like Akira Yamaoka, the composer and producer of the Silent Hill series. We've got uh, John Romero again, back from FPS Doc, talking about Doom and all the controversy surrounding it. We've got Hifumi Kono, who is the creator of Clock Tower. We've got the guys who made Dead by Daylight, the guys who made Outlast. We've got loads and loads of really, really cool, interesting people in there. And we are still actually updating that cast list if you follow our socials. So be tuned for announcements. But yeah, if you go on the website, terabytesdoc.com, you'll be able to grab a digital or physical copy of the release. Every single purchase comes with a free copy of our previous documentary, FPS. Um, and every single one of them, every single purchase at this stage will get your name in the credits of the final production, as well as access to the digital soundtrack. And if you buy physical, you get a limited numbered release of the Blu-ray. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So definitely, like you guys just listened to Daniel say all this stuff. If you want to be a part of this project, definitely hit, get over to the website become a backer because definitely it's worth it, you know, doing all this stuff. It's cool if you love horror gaming and just horror in general or just helping support people get things off the ground. You know, this is definitely important today because now everyone has, you know, their way of helping out, you know, so I think that's cool. Um, Daniel, how did you get involved with Creator VC? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, I actually come from a filmmaking background, though I've always been a massive, huge um, fan of horror gaming. Um, funny enough, the reason I kind of got into filmmaking was because of a deep, 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 
deep love of Silent Hill 2, which I know isn't okay. necessarily the jump you would think, <laughs> like, oh, I play the game, so now I want to make films. But it kind of just the narrative just sort of blew up my imagination. And that was just the medium I sort of fell into. Um, and so I got involved with um, Creator VC when I had a chance encounter with the CEO of the studio, Robin Block. Um, through a discussion on another project that I unfortunately can't talk about. Um, but while we we're discussing that project, you know, and he kind of got new as he saw my filmmaking background, I have a personal YouTube um, where I analyze horror. Um, and he kind of had a look at that. And he just sort of thought it would be a great fit to work together. And so we did. We started working together. I was a creative advisor on In Search of Darkness 90s. I helped on FPS stock. Um, and then from the back of those collaborations and kind of working on this other project, um, we had a chance where I was able to pitch to him. And so I kind of said, you know, like, well, we're, we all love horror here. I'm a big horror gaming fan and we've just done really well with the gaming doc. Like, why aren't we, you know, combining the best, best of both worlds. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was intrigued by the idea, but he, uh, as, as the studio head, it's not really his job to be invested in each and every single um, thing we cover. He just kind of has to assign the right teams to it. So he isn't really um, involved in the horror game and scene. So, you know, he was like, well, that sounds cool, but I'd like to know a bit more. Um, so, you know, I put together a massive pitch, um, like a 40 page dot of like, what games would feature, who would be in it, what the kind of narrative structure would be, uh, what topics we would cover, how do I see it, is it a series, is it a film, what are different angles we could take it into. And, you know, I presented him with this this sort of big pitch deck. And, uh, yeah, he liked it. Um, so then we validated it. We sort of put some feelers out, asked people in surveys, like, is this something you would want to see? And the response we got was really great. We've been really blown away by it. Um, and so... After, you know, a series of hurdles just kept getting knocked down in front of us. It's just like, okay, yeah, this is going great. This is going great. This is going great. This is going great. And then the trailer came out and we sort of, before we'd even, you know, released a press release, um, Fangoria and Bloody Disgusting and Dread Central and stuff were like doing coverage on where, and it just sort of became very obvious of like, oh, we, we've, we've hit something that people yeah. are passionate about, which doesn't yeah. surprise me because I'm one of those people. Like I'm, yeah. I'm very, very passionate about this stuff. Um, and that's been, you know, kind of a, it, I'm abridging it, but that's kind of been a, like a nine month long process to get to this point. Um, but now we are live, we are going ahead and the, yeah. the pre-sales campaign is there. You can help us help make this thing and make it spectacular. And it's all very, very, very exciting. Um, and yeah, I am producing on the project. Um, we've got a fantastic team attached. We have the producer and writer of FPS Doc has came over to write and direct this uh, series. Um, he's a very, very accomplished writer named Miss Richard Moss. He has, you know, two books out, Shareware Heroes and The Secret History of Mac Gaming. He is an incredibly accomplished and prolific, um, you know, gaming historian um, with, in, you know, bylines for basically every major game and publication you can think about. You know, he's got a long, uh, illustrious career. We've got um, Chris Stratton, who uh, did the cinematography on the video game documentary, Here Comes a New Challenger, not okay. uh, one of ours, but it was a Street Fighter 2 documentary. And if you've seen that film, it yeah. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, and obviously, you know, we've got me kind of bringing in all of the talent and stuff and, and knowing what kind of stuff we need to cover. And uh, basically, it's just it's just all kind of snowballing into something great and we're really really excited to kind of um bring it all in front of your eyes oh man i'm so happy that you you put something together like this and made this pitch and you know made it possible and made it happen because like you i'm also a big huge gamer and growing up with like games uh horror games it was definitely different you know because i was younger at the time but my brother would play these games and i would just be like oh man what the what the hell is this you know and so i got hooked and so i just need to know um what are some of your favorite horror games, you know, that you got hooked to? Because you, you do, oh, we do uh, say Silent, um, Silent Hill too, but what are some other ones that definitely 
Stand yeah, Up 2. Well, Silent Hill 2 was actually like one of the later titles um, mm-hmm. that I got into. Uh, that kind of came around about the time I hit college. I think if I'd played it before then, it probably would have went straight over my yeah. head because that's, yep. that's, a, that's not a game for children. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have... So I think Silent Hill 2 is 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 top, 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 top yeah. tier. You know, I, I don't mm-hmm. just think that's my my favorite horror game i think it might be my favorite game of all time it might be my favorite piece of fiction okay of all time um but i've got a lot a lot of horror loves um in the gaming space uh and to be honest depending on when you ask me i could give you a million different answers uh so i'll start off with the the easy and obvious one um you know it's it's kind of a lot of people's favorite a lot of people love it Resident Evil, specifically the very, very first Resident Evil, um, was one of my formative horror gaming experiences. Though I will say that I do think the best Resident Evil experience is Resident Evil Remake, the 2002 GameCube remake, um, which is, if you haven't played it, it's basically the best way to experience Resident Evil. Uh, Shinji Mikami, the director of and creator of Resident Evil, he has said that that version of the game is basically the game that he wanted to make back in the PS1 days, but couldn't okay. due to the limitations of the technology at the time. And I mm. think it shows. Um, I think it's an incredibly beautiful game um, that just could not have ever come. You couldn't have done anything close to it on a PlayStation 1. But with some very, very, very clever technology, uh, they managed to make that game look you know, even for the GameCube, like leagues ahead of its time. It yeah. still stands toe to toe alongside like PlayStation 4 games now. Um, all through, you know, really clever trickery with how they use the pre-rendered backgrounds and stuff. But basically it's 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 a beautiful, beautiful game, but it's not just a pretty game. Through that stunning design and style comes just one of the most evocative atmospheres uh, you will ever play in a video game. And I think it's made more evocative by the fact that it is a remake in a way because there's a familiarity with the Spencer Mansion that if you're a fan of Resident Evil, you go into this game with. And the game will often use that familiarity to create a a discomfort in you. Mm -hmm. Um, It will often rug pull you, push you into new areas, um, change puzzles around, change... um, enemy placements around and i think you know it's it's weird that it benefits from the other version of it existing but i I really think it does which is not to say that the original game isn't fantastic like i say that was a formative formative experience for me i remember playing it when i was way too young to be playing it and (laughs) probably should not have been um and uh my mom did not know I was playing it because I was never ever allowed to play these horror games growing up, which is kind of crazy now that I'm producing, you know, a massive horror documentary with some yeah. of the biggest talents <laughs> in the industry. Uh, but yeah, I was always sort of forbidden from the horror games. You know, it was it was Mario, Spyro, and Crash. That was your bag. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. not allowed to play anything with zombies. <laughs> you're not allowed to play anything with their uh, stabbings and maulings and chainsaws and what have you. Mm. But um, I remember sneakily getting into Resident Evil because I'd read about it in um, magazines. And just to give you an idea of how uh, conservative my mother was with this stuff, I actually had those magazines confiscated off me when she realized that they they, uh, (laughs) had stuff about horror games in. Uh, And I remember I was at uh, a boot sale, which is like, uh, I forget what Americans call it. Like, it's not like a yard sale. Like, you know where uh, everybody sells stuff out the back of cars? Yeah. Um, um, Uh, Right now, yeah. It's, um, what's the word? It's like blowing my mind. Like I can't think of it at all. Um, Damn, um flea, like it's a like flea it's a flea market. flea market. It's a yeah, flea kind market. of like a flea market. So, yep. anyways, I was at I was at one of these. We call them boot sales in the UK, um, and there was one of those old uh, CD wallets. Okay. Um, where <clears throat> you remember in the nineties, lots of people used to keep their DVDs and the CDs and the discs in those like little wallets just for like ease where they could carry like 50 instead of like 50 yeah. boxes. Um, and I found a CD wallet full of PlayStation games. And I think for the, the paltry sum of two pounds, this guy was selling um, just this, this job lot of PlayStation one games. And you know, my mom had a quick flick through and she saw, you know, the obvious, you know, Crash, Spiral, yep. 
um, like I think Tomb Raider was in there, which raised an eyebrow a little bit, but she let it slide. <laughs> but she didn't catch the Resident Evil disc, that beautiful, beautiful disc where the pupil is the yep. the eye point, the hole in the disc. Oh, I love that design. <laughs> um, so I managed to sneakily be allowed to buy that and then play it um, on the nighttime when I thought I could get away with it. Um, and the idea of playing that as a child was already terrifying, but the terror is multiplied when you're terrified about also getting caught playing it. Yeah. So the atmosphere of that game, like that's still to this day, you know, I I'll play it now and it's, 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 it's like can't be fun basically, but at the time still the scariest experience I have ever, ever had playing a video game. Um, but yeah, I love, I love so many of them, you know, and quite mm. often I'll like play through things, uh, you know, that really surprises and find their way into my favorites when they weren't even on my radar before. Uh, a recent one I've, I've talked about on a lot of podcasts, just because I think it's really, really underrated, is a, a game called Yuppie Cycle, okay. which is a sort of satirical office survival horror where you play as this young guy called Brian who gets a job at this mega corporation um and he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing at this job it's all very like satirical about like useless jobs and people in offices just kind of buying time and stuff and he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing there but he really desperately needs the job so he plays along and then they tell him on the day like oh you're our resident witch hunter and he's like what and <laughs> you slowly have to unravel the mystery of this really surreal darkly comedic like huge sinister corporation and the witch that apparently haunts its halls and i i thought it was just brilliantly written um and great characters really lovely art style just and and doing a lot of things that you wouldn't expect in horror um like it manages to be scary while being both 2d and really brightly colored mm. um whereas you know traditionally we think of like horror games as you know dark dim you know keep everything in the in hidden away and like coming out of the darkness um so i just thought it was doing a lot of really interesting and cool things um i recently played slay the princess which is kind of like a cosmic horror visual novel thought that was like really amazing the way they handled like multi-branching narrative paths uh yeah i mean i could yeah. I, I, I could just list off games for like the rest of time if you let us so we'll we'll if i if i was to just say like my top five I'm going to go with Silent Hill 2, mm. Resident Evil Remake, and Resident Evil 7, actually. I know some people prefer yeah. Village. Um, yep. 7, just, I don't know, I don't know why 7, just, it just clicks with us more than any of the other games. Um, yeah. I'm really partial to Outlast, but specifically the Whistleblower DLC, which I know is yeah. a very specific thing, but I really love the Whistleblower DLC of the first game. And what can be fifth? Honestly, probably Yuppie Cycle. I'd probably put that in my top okay. five. Yeah, those are some great choices because, you know, like I said, like for me growing up, like Nintendo, the original Nintendo was around. So like the Friday the 13th and uh, mm. a Nightmare on Elm Street. I was too young to play. They were probably like, I was probably like three years old when they came out. But as I got older and I go on back and I play those games, I'm kind of like, oh, man, these were hard to play. But for like my oh, time, so hard, so yeah. hard. There's, there's, there's a reason there's a term that exists called Nintendo hard. People have stopped yeah. using it so much now that Dark Souls has kind of took over the hard game, like top tier mantle. But Nintendo hard used to be a throw. Uh, a phrase that people would throw around to describe when something was really difficult yeah. um because those games will absolutely kick your ass the day <laughs> uh i mean i kind of i can't remember which is harder i know some of the boss fights in nightmare on elm street were insane yeah. but the even just like the basic enemies in friday the 13th when you were yeah, going like left the zombies right, like jumping the up and, and down stuff, yeah they were they were insane and then you look at something that's like kind of horror tinged, like ghouls and ghosts. And honestly, I've played that game a hundred times. I've still never seen the ending. Uh, <laughs> it's, so it was a wild time to 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 be in the games. Um, yep. Just very, very, very difficult. And I'd seen that you guys uh, also pointed out a few games. You know that I like where I was able to actually play and like do well was uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors and yeah, uh, you know. Uh, um, 
Night Trap. You know, what I mean, that was hard. It was a hard game too, but like they remade it. So I, I was even playing like Night Trap on the Switch and kind of like getting a feel for it. Now I know where they kind of got the whole thing for Five Nights at Freddy's from, you know? So yeah, kind of yeah. getting that whole style. So a, a really fun bit of trivia that I absolutely love uh, with Night Trap is that um, if you know anything about that game's history, you'll know it was extremely yeah. controversial. Yep. Like we are talking, there was a court case about it and, you know, it almost got banned and there was senators being like violent video games are poisoning our kids' mind and they're holding up Night Trap in court and waving it around and being like, blah, I banned this sick filth. Um, and because you know, American governments don't really know anything about video games. They had um, representatives from like different video game companies there. Uh, and they, one of them was a legal representative for um, Nintendo, who was basically there on Nintendo's behalf to reassure parents of like, don't worry, this is nothing to do with us. Like, like just okay. so you know, because obviously, you know, <laughs> Parents aren't going to be any the wiser. They're going to be like, oh, those video games I heard that Night Trap on that Nintendo was, you know, teaching people <laughs> to kill and all that. So there was literally basically a guy from Nintendo was there to just be like, this is all on Sega. Blame yeah. them. Look at them. Yep. This is all them. And one of the things he said uh, was, I can't remember if it was that. I'd have to look it up now, but I can't remember if it was a legal rep or the um, CEO of Nintendo of America at the time. One of the things he said was, and I quote, Night Trap will never release on a Nintendo system. You can mark my words. <laughs> and now it's on Switch. And yeah, I just think is. that's a lovely, lovely yeah. little thing there. What a wonderful, what a wonderful tale. Yeah, it's definitely a piece of history because, you know, like I said, it came out for Sega CD. And so not a lot of people were able to kind of get that, you know what I mean? So I remember like just me being like one of the kids on the block that had it. And so it would be different. Like you're seeing like visuals now, like an actual movie footage you know from from the regular graphics that we would get so definitely that game's definitely a piece of history with all the back stuff to trying to be getting it banned so it's yeah. crazy as well because i don't know if you know this too um the the efforts to censor that game made it mm. infinitely more violent mm. so during the making of the game you know the people who were making it it was originally going to be vampires were the enemy yeah. and you know they were told no 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 vampires that's too violent and they were like, okay, well, ninjas then were like, no, 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 no that's too violent. <laughs> um, well, they were like, but they've got to like suck blood and stuff or like do some, you know, be threatening in some way. So that's when they, the, the workaround was to invent that weird, you know, it's like a claw hand that yeah. grabs the neck and it goes into the neck. And I'm like, that's way more brutal than vampires. <laughs> a vampire is just a bite. This is like an invasive surgery. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, all of the stories around it was like, uh, you know, you play and you have to try and kill the teenagers, which couldn't be further from the truth. That's literally the game over state. You have to save the teens. Like, that's the entire point of the game. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's an interesting one. I love, um, this is something we're going to touch on on the doc, um, actually. Um, we're looking, we've got an episode called Cursed and Controversial, where we specifically okay. look at, like, some of the controversies that have afflicted the video game medium especially in the obviously the horror genre so you know you've got your doom and your night trap and all of the like satanic panic around doom and all the controversy around night trap but there's other stuff as well um one that blows my mind is uh rule of rose which was a ps2 survival horror game mm. uh it's the one that if you are collecting horror games will give you nightmares when you see the price of it on ebay because my god uh, <laughs> those those things have skyrocketed in value yeah. um probably due to all of the taboo nature and stories surrounding it um it's particularly problematic for me because it didn't get released here because of the controversy there's a mm. current common narrative that it got banned it didn't quite get banned it just got so much heat that the publishers kind of went like let's just forget about releasing it in the UK. It's not worth it. We don't want this bad press. Yeah. But what's mad about that game and the bad press it got is that all of it was a lie. Like, at least with Night Trap, you can kind of argue that the teens being killed was in the game. And, you know, there was violence against teenage girls in the game. Yeah. Uh, Night Trap, there was loads and loads of, like, news reports and there was, um, you know, 
sensationalist headlines in papers and stuff talking about how this game like encouraged you to kill children and you had mm. to bury a kid alive and there was all this pedophilia in it and none of that happens was that, yeah. none, none of it happens at all like literally it's, it's just a complete complete lie none of that exists in the game but the narrative was powerful enough that it basically ruined the game's release and now it goes for the least four hundred dollars on eBay. <laughs> it's, oh, a, it's a wild, wild, wild <laughs> thing. And what's even crazier is the original report that kind of kickstarted off all of this sensationalism and all of these lies was on an Italian news broadcaster um, that was released around the time. Um, and the report that destroyed Rule of Rose is now lost media. Oh, okay, yeah. But Rule of Rose is still kicking around. So yeah. <laughs> what, is it, what does that say to the value of those two things? Yeah, that's cool. Because, you know, I mean, like the, with this documentary, like you said, like you're putting all this information out there for some gamers that have no idea about mm. this history of all this stuff. And so that's what makes it really cool and special. So everyone listening, like like you wouldn't think all this stuff happens. Like we hear it a lot about in horror films, you know what I mean? Because it was more in the media, more in the news and everything like that. But games were kind of like swept under the rug and you had to like dig deep to get all this information on it. Mm. Um, so it was really cool. And so there's another game that I had seen on the um, social media page that you guys were uh, promoting was Clock Tower. I remember yes. renting that game and I'm just like, dude, like that was like the first game that like, you know, that had the experience of like a slasher game, like someone just chasing you and you had to like hide and do all this stuff. And that was just like really crazy. So, um, yeah, uh, going back to my top five, actually, now that you mentioned Clock Tower, I'm like, <laughs> oh, that should have been in there, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Clock Tower, I, I, I find uh, just incredibly, incredibly fascinating because I assume the one you're, you're playing yeah. that you referred to is the ps1 release yeah uh, which is also very 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 good um the the clock tower that really won my heart though and it doesn't even have an official english release yet but it mm. is it is coming through um limited run games i believe um was the one on the snes um the first fear as it mm. gets uh, sort of colloquialized because clock tower on ps1 kind of replaced its narrative um but if you look back at that even though it's like 2d side on pixel art i remember playing that um i remember reading about it on the internet when i was younger and being like oh this is fascinating this kind of like you know comes into my wheelhouse but yeah. it was like sort of before i really knew how to like access any of these games i was like well this is a japanese game you know i wish i could play it but i'm never going to be i'm never going to be able to um, but then, you know, as I got older and I sort of like learned about more about the scene and things, I realized, you know, oh, you can like English patch it yourself. Um, because, you know, some really devoted fan out there has translated the whole game. What a legend. Um, and I remember playing it. And at the time, you know, that I played Clock Tower, at this point, like the PlayStation 2 is out. So we're, you know, 15, 20 years removed from that, that game's mm -hmm. release. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh, this will be like a fun curiosity, but like, obviously it won't be scary. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a SNES game or an SNES <laughs> game. I know people get funny about yeah. the name of the console. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Paul, Paul, firmly in the SNES camp. I think that might be a UK thing though. Um, but yeah, I was like, it's a SNES game. This isn't gonna, this isn't gonna like evoke any scares. It's just going to be like a bit of campy fun. And then as I was playing it, I was like, holy shit, this is terrifying. Like, even within the limitations of, you know, that graphics chip and the 2D art, the sound design on that game, even though it's really digitized and compressed, yeah. and the, the art style just, like, it is scary as hell. Like, it is so evocative and atmospheric, and it is staggering that they were able to achieve that on such limited technology. Yeah. Now, that, that's cool because, like I said, now you look at everything, and so you're also to take all this information that you have, and so that fans that are actually going to be able to pre-order, they're going to be able to dig deeper with a vidcast that you can... Can you touch on that? Yeah, so um, what we like to do, um, and we've done this with other documentaries too, we did it with uh, Aliens Expanded and stuff. Um, what we like to do is, um, because we're sort of asking you to pre-order to help us fund the film now, 
Um, we don't want to make it so that you have to wait the entire, you know, production period before you see any return on that investment. Um, so with, that's why, you know, with this uh, campaign, we're like, hey, you get a free copy of, um, a free digital copy of FPS mm-hmm. with every order. That's super cool. Um, but also what we plan to do is like a year long celebration, kind of similar to what we did with Aliens. I can't say what those live events are yet, but basically, if you can imagine, there'll be these sort of monthly live events that if you back at pre-sales, you get access where you might get things like a QA and a with uh, developers or a, um, we might have somebody come in and play through their game that they've made while talking through it and all the decisions behind it. We might do like a horror educa- horror gaming education lesson where someone like goes into the engine and shows you the internal build of their game and breaks down like what trigger points exist in which places. Um, and in, and yeah, and we'll also obviously do, you know, kind of updates on the movie and uh, updates on the series, sorry, and its development and take on questions from people who've backed and are interested in, you know, the documentary's development and show you some editing stuff and all of that. And so, yeah, the the goal would just be to kind of host like monthly, um, you know, celebrations of horror gaming um, that will hopefully, you know, interest the the audience that would ever back, you know, a horror gaming documentary. (laughs) Um, And like I say, I can't announce exactly who is involved with that. Because one, we still need to finalize some. And two, you know, we want it to be a surprise for some of the others. We yeah. do have like a list of topics we'll be touching on within the, the website, if you have a look at that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting because it's like, you know, when you work it out, what you're actually paying for with the backing the dock is, you know, you get the five hour series, then you get the five hours of, um, you know, the new documentary. So there's 10 hours there, but then there's also going to be at least 15 plus hours of live events. Okay. So it's like 25 hours of con- worth of content at least. Oh. Um, so we're really, really excited for people to kind of come along and get to know us, get to know some of the favorite developers, get to see some of the favorite games and deconstruct them with the people who made them. It, it's all really cool stuff. Yeah. Now, some other stuff stuck out to me too. You guys are going to have some collectible merchandise. Uh, yeah. To touch on that. Yeah. So we have this really, really, really gorgeous poster designed by Rashid Loft. Yeah. A Loft. Sorry. Got his name slightly wrong there. But uh, he is an artist who works with these kind of like cool, stylized realism collages. Um, so we've got this really gorgeous poster um, design that he did. And we've incorporated that design onto T-shirts and mouse mats and key rings and stuff. Um, if you have a look at the design, it is on the website, I, uh, as with is everything else. It's a really cool homage to just horror gaming history. Um, you can look at that poster for, you know, 10 minutes and still not still be counting references. Yeah. There's so <laughs> many little Easter eggs all over the poster. So we wanted to create an image that was not just striking, um, but that also, you know, became like a fun thing in its own right. Um, you could totally use that image as a sort of like checklist of, uh, you know, like a where's Wally of what game am I playing today? A where's Waldo? Yeah. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I always forget I'm talking to, <laughs> I, I do so many podcasts in so many countries. I've got to like regionalize and nationalize yeah. what you think. But yeah, where's Waldo? You can play where's Waldo with it with uh, horror game references. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we have a limited uh, blood red uh, Blu-ray case uh, okay. for all of the numbered releases. And yeah, the releases will also be special numbered releases for all backers at this stage. Nice. Now, With a slipcase too. I forgot to mention uh, the slipcase. Everybody okay. loves a Blu-ray slipcase. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you definitely need that today. And, you know, with physical media going out the door, this mm. is big, you know, so... I know a lot of people like to stream, but, you know, if you want to get your hands on a physical copy, this is the way, you know. So. Yeah, totally. We're big, we're big, 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 big fans of physical media. Yeah. Um, obviously, we do, you know, sell the digital. And if you do buy the physical, you also get the digital included with that. So you get a digital backup. Um, but, yeah, we're, 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 we're huge fans of, of, of physical media. And we always try 
wherever possible. Um, and so far, it's been possible every single time to do physical releases alongside our all of our projects. Okay, cool. Now, Daniel, can you share any info, or any upcoming other projects you have going on and tell the listeners where they can find you on social media? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can follow me personally. Um, I am Dan Drambles on everything. You can find us on YouTube as Dan Drambles, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all the kind of general places. Um, in terms of creative VC projects, obviously, you know, I'll be working very heavily on terabytes, but we do also have uh, Aliens Expanded coming up this year. That'll be out next few months maybe don't quote us on that one i'm not part of that team officially but i just know it's it's in the it's in the background and i've seen some screenings of it uh early screens of it and some of the motion graphic stuff and it's going to be amazing it looks great um and we're also working on the thing expanded which is a five hour deep dive into john carpenter's absolute masterpiece of a classic the thing obviously um and yeah as if you follow me on youtube as well i'm always doing stuff on there you know um if you like your yeah, horror analysis you've got a big retrospective stuff uh you've got a big retrospective to look back there as i have just wrapped up on a project i call wholesome halloween uh which is every october i do a 31 day long video essay marathon and the last one i just did was my very last one and we hit 100 episodes because i did three marathons yearly and then like a couple of bonus episodes and then ended on the hundredth episode so you literally have like a hundred video essays of horror analysis to watch on there um always doing stuff if you follow us anywhere and if you follow creative ac you'll constantly see we're popping up with new projects and new ideas and new things we've got coming out both you know me as as an individual and as part of the company um we're all very very busy but it's all very very exciting Nice. Congrats on your um on your hundredth episode. Uh that you know, it's a lot of hard work putting all this content out. But um Daniel, thanks for coming on. And for everyone listening, Terabytes the Evolution of Horror Gaming campaign is live. So go out and support because this ends on March third. And for everybody listening, we will be back next week with another episode. Until then, take it easy. Uh, pretty. All of you are